are. Hello, Robin. Hey. Hi, how are you? Great. Thanks for having me. Yes, absolutely. Boy, that was such an awesome first hour. Oh my that goodness. Was that was, yeah, that was awesome. That was really cool. So, oh my goodness, like so many things. I was like trying to write down notes. I'm just like, oh my gosh, I didn't know this. Oh my gosh, I didn't know this. So it's oh, all very, cool. very exciting. Yeah, yeah, super cool. Definitely. So, um, but yeah, you feel you've been you know, feeling it out, getting comfortable, enjoying everyone's input. And, uh, oh, this is great. It was, it's been good. great talking and, and hearing the poems. It's just been a nice mix of everything. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Hi, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Yeah, I was, um, one thing I was, I, I didn't know that Mary Sheller's, Shelley's mom was a writer. I had no clue. I yeah. didn't even know. So that is awesome. That is incredible. Oh, great. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we actually, I had a live um, that I did a couple weeks ago with um, Mel. I'm going to read a piece of hers tonight, too. But we decided that we were going to, you know, we're like, you know what? Let's just read some classics. And, you know, let's pick out, like, some of our favorites. And even though it wasn't poetry, but I pulled out an excerpt from Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. And um, so I actually ended up sharing that. Which oh, that's cool. cool. Oh, yeah, that's great. <laughs> great. I'm glad the convergence <laughs> happened tonight. That's excellent. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, so that was like, that was amazing. That was, that was super cool. But uh, now you're a musician. I'm a musician. And uh, so I did, uh, I did, I have to say, I kind of, I YouTubed your bands. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which was this, uh, Pet Theories? I, I the, um, it was the other one. I YouTubed, oh, uh, yeah, the, on of the drummer for, yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, Drumming on Glass. Drumming on Glass. Yes. When I had black hair and I had more of it, man. I mean, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so that was fun. That was some. That was fun. You guys had some. That was some intense music. You guys had some good sound going on. Oh, thank you, thank so, you. Yeah, that it was. was fun. It was. Uh, uh, they were amazing musicians to play with. I, I miss them. Yeah. 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 I'm Are in a guys... cool band now called Bummer Deluxe, but we don't have anything on YouTube yet. So don't have yeah. anything on YouTube. Oh, okay. Yeah, we're just working on our first recording. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. well, hey, that's exciting though. It so, is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But you did get to tour a little bit though too. Yeah. Yeah, with Drumming on Glass, we did a, a a nice tour for our first album and. You know, I live in Chicago now, but my, my first visit, we were, we were from Boston. My first visit to Chicago was on tour. It was like the, the best way to see a major city was when yeah. like, you're, you're playing at one of their nightclubs. You know? yeah. yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So now, did you get to write any of the songs? Yeah, did some of the, well, we all, we all contributed to the arrangements and the musical songwriting. And then I did, yeah. I did some of the lyrics. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the um, are there any on the first album, I think? The lyrics I contributed, oh yeah, there's um, two of the songs on the first album I wrote the lyrics for, and then the second album, I didn't play on it, but I wrote, I think, two of the songs on the second album, too, two of the, lyrics, the verses. That's the lyrics. awesome. Yeah. Very, very cool. Very cool. Well, I, I'm not as groovy as you. I'm a classical pianist, and so yeah. <laughs> I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit more structured. <laughs> I want to, I want to play the piano, though. I want to learn, so I, I think that's really groovy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> thanks. Yeah. So good. I can be groovy, too. Absolutely. <laughs> We're both groovy. <laughs> All right. Very cool. Very cool. Awesome. But no, um, so I was absolutely fascinated with, um, we talked a little bit when we did our Zoom meeting and everything, but I was so fascinated with your book series that you did of, um, of the, the Dark Shadows, right? Yeah, yeah. I, and so basically the, the entire series, all three books, correct? It's all in poem, it's all one poem? Yeah, except it's it's actually um, it's ongoing. Like I'm writing I'm writing the fourth book now, okay. and it might be it might be eight or nine books if I live long enough. But yeah, yeah. right now there are three published, like you said. Yeah, yeah. That is amazing. So now it was also inspired by you had said a, like a soap opera that you grew up um, just in the in the generation. Yeah, yeah. I um, when I was really small, like you can't see where my hands. <laughs> Stay at home mom and we would we I'd watch TV with her every day and, and I was yeah. a little kid and she loved soap operas. So I'd watch all the soap operas with her. And this was in the late sixties. And there was one soap opera called Dark Shadows. Mm -hmm. And it was like every other soap opera on TV where you know people would fall in love and fall out of yeah. love and be yeah. really melodramatic and I loved all that. Yeah. But this soap opera, the main character was a vampire, a 200 year old oh. vampire, and um, he scared the hell out of me. And every <laughs> night, well, almost every night, I'd have these nightmares about this vampire and the same recurring nightmares quite often. 
And um, I wanted to write about that my whole life because I'd yeah. watch it every, the show every day with my mom and then I'd have nightmares. Yeah. And it wasn't until about nine years ago I got this idea. Yeah. And uh, so what I'm doing in a nutshell is I'm watching every episode of the show. Mm -hmm. I'm writing one sentence in response to each episode. And it's um, I use that sentence to kind of write my autobiography. So it's um, I think of it as an experiment in autobiography. I talk about yeah. the show, but I talk about my life. Um, and it's a lot of fun. Yeah. It's it's also, you know, um, I can't believe I'm still doing it. But, it, you know, I yeah. knew it was a long project. I knew it was yes. like 20 years. So yeah. here I am. <laughs> yeah. That is awesome. There's like quite a few people that even recognize the name of the show. So that's yeah, cool. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of people saying <laughs> yeah. that they've liked it or their parents watch it, which is excellent. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I never, I never did. I, I hadn't heard of it, and so, but when I, when I um, heard what your project was and how you were going about it, I just found that completely. I was enthralled with the idea. I was just oh, like, that's great! Oh, I'm glad. Yeah. Yeah. So that is very, very cool. Well, since Andy had to, he cut off. Um, I wanted to make sure that I that his piece was read. So Andy. Oh yeah. Is it okay if I read your piece, Andy? Give me a thumbs up if you're cool with that. Unless maybe he wants to save it and he wants to share it at a later time. <laughs> and if that's the case, I totally respect that. But. You better say something, Andy. I'm pulling it up right now. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm sure he'll be fine with it. Yeah. Be good. Oh, there he is. Okay, there we, okay got it. All right. Okay. So, uh, so yes. So this is a, the Andy Morales, and this is his his piece, and it is called "Why Do I Bother." Okay. When is it right to be right? When is it wrong to be wrong? And when is it low to feel low? When is it enough to feel enough and why do I bother? When is it okay to hide within myself and when is it okay to love myself and never return? When is it okay to cry and never get judged? And when is it okay to lose my sanity? Why do I bother? When is it okay to say yes and when is it okay to say no? When is it okay to say maybe? When is it okay to overthink? Why do I bother? When is it okay to say no more? When is it okay to want no more? When is it okay to say anything? When is it okay to want anything? And when is it okay to do anything? Why do I bother? When will I finally be taken seriously? When will I finally get to talk? When will I finally win an argument? When will I finally not be interrupted? Why do I bother? When will I breathe again? When will I smile again? When will I stop feeling embarrassed about myself? And when will I finally admit that I have schizotypal personality disorder? When will these labels stop making me feel less human? And why do I bother? So when is it okay? When is it okay? When is anything okay? When was any of this okay? When was any of this all okay? And why do I bother? Why do I bother? Leave me alone. Why do I bother? Leave me alone. Leave me alone. Why do I bother? Leave me alone. Why do I bother? Leave me alone. Mm. That was me, Andy Morales. Oh, that's great. Thanks, Andy. <laughs> oh. Yeah. That was yeah. awesome, Andy. And again, just totally, completely proud of him for, you know, for writing that, for stepping out of his comfort zone. Because I know that there were some, you know, some hard, hard truths for him in that, you know, to be able to admit and, you know, and, and embrace, you know, where he's at and to share that with everyone. So that is, that is really awesome. So yeah. Bravo to you, Andy. That was great. Right on. I really liked that, <laughs> like that repetition of when is it okay? Why do I bother? And as I was hearing it, I was like, it's so great that... Mm -hmm that you're bothering, you're writing the poem. There it is. You yes, know, and, absolutely. And like keep bothering. This is good. Yes, you know, I was, I was, yes. That's what I was thinking as I was listening. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I, I love it too, because I feel like there's so much of him in there, you know, so mm -hmm. much of the time he's just like, Oh, I'm so sorry, you guys, my thoughts are sporadic. And we're like, no, 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 this is you. And this is who you are. Yes. It's okay. And I love how he just really embraced that part of himself. And he just put that out there for us to just, uh, to just enjoy and see a real piece of him. So yeah, right on. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very cool. So, um, so now what did you, so you started writing obviously pretty young. So you're always interested, um, you know, cause you're a you know, professor, English professor of uh, creative writing and, um, and English at Columbia. Oh, sorry. Columbia college in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And so now did you start, you know, your works and things prior to becoming a professor? Um, you know, at where you're at now, or did that, which one came first? The writing or the, or the, yeah, yeah. the profession or the writing, which one came um, first? 
the writing came first, and, and it was, it was uh, um, um, a real, uh, um, I'll use the word obsession, but in a really good way. Like, it was a real obsession. My, 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 my obsessions, my biggest uh, uh, obsessions growing up were making music and writing. And so mm -hmm. I feel yeah. totally lucky I can do both as, as an adult, yes. you know? And, um, yeah, yeah. But it was just an obsession, and it was just like any art form. You feel like you got to do it. You just have to write, and and mm -hmm. and you're not going to feel good in the head if you're not writing, or, or if, if yes. what you're writing doesn't is, is you don't like what you're writing. Yeah. So it's what I always did, and um, I uh, I felt really lucky when I was an undergraduate in college. I I uh, took a poetry workshop class, and I didn't even know poetry workshops existed. Yes. I was the first person in my family to go to college, so I was like, I didn't know you could do this. <laughs> yeah. and, and then I loved it, and yeah. I thought, wow, like, you get yeah. your work critiqued, and they, you know, everyone's helping you with what's working and what's not working, mm -hmm. and I just loved that so much mm -hmm. that I was like, well, I want to write because... I, I want to make other people feel what I feel when I read good poems. Yeah. And then yeah. after I started taking poetry workshops, I thought, well, maybe I want to teach because um, I feel so good in these workshops. Maybe I can make workshops that will make students feel good. And yes. so it's sort of, they worked hand in hand, but the writing came first. Yeah. Yeah. That is awesome. That's amazing. So now, now that you've gone through, like, you know, so for me, I am not a, I'm not a well-versed like poet. I'm just, I, I didn't even, you know, I never even considered myself a poet prior to even coming on here and being introduced to this, um, you know, writing community. Um, you know, I never, you know, took those courses, you know, in college or anything um, in that regard. And so I always just, can, I always called my writings rants. You know, I'm like, oh, I just rant. <laughs> you know, I just rant, I just rant. Yeah. Now, uh, do you find that you are pulled more towards more structurally sound, um, you know, poetic forms? Or do you, are, are you okay with, like, there's, I mean, loose form is so out there nowadays. I mean, it's yeah. just all over the place. I, you know, I, I like, I like traditional forms. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I've, I've, I've written sonnets, I've written villanelles and sestinas. I think they're really cool. Mm -hmm. um, I like, but I like to work in traditional forms with a voice that sounds contemporary, you know, mm -hmm. sounds like, you know, to 21st century. Yeah. Um, but I think ultimately at, at my deepest core, I'm drawn to poems that sound like the way people really talk. Mm -hmm. And so if I feel like, you know, like the poet Frank O'Hara once said, he, he thinks of a poem as like picking up a phone and calling a friend. And mm. those are my favorite kinds of poems when I feel like the poet is just picking up a phone and calling yeah. me and we're, we're talking like two mm -hmm. regular human beings. And it's shaped like a poem, you know, it's shaped in its right. own way. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, but, but I, I like poems that sound like, like I like to write like I talk and I like it mm -hmm. when other people are writing like how they talk. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, for sure. Would you want to read uh, read something of yours? Because I, yeah. I would love that. Sure. Um, you know, since we we're talking about dark, dark shadows, um, maybe I'll read uh, I'll read a poem from the new book. Um, uh, so this is book three. As Robin was saying, it's called Ghosts of the Upper Floor, um, and uh, it's published by Blaze Box Books. And I'm really I have to do a shout out to my publisher, yeah. uh, uh, Jeffrey Gassa. He, um, when I first pitched this project to him, mm -hmm. I said to him, look, I know this is going to sound really weird. And uh, he listened to it and he said, this is amazing. I want to publish all the books. And I was oh, like, that is so cool. You're the best. And he yeah, is the best. Well, thank you. Thank he you takes much. such risks in his, in his <laughs> books. And, and he's a great poet himself, too. So, yeah. um, so it's, uh, you can get the book on uh, the BlazeVox website. Also on my Instagram page, uh, on my profile, you can click the link. Um, okay. So I explained the book, I explained earlier how I'm watching Dark Shadows, writing one sentence in response to each episode. You really don't need to know who the characters are and this, this is a short prose poem, uh, except Barnabas is the vampire. Uh, there's a guy named Joe Haskell. Um, you don't need to know much about him, except he, he looks like the kind of guy in the 60s who would beat up hippies. Uh, <laughs> but, but he's a nice character, even though okay. it's just my projection. Uh, and, um, and oh, the other thing to know is that when I was a kid and I was afraid of Barnabas, I would go to bed and I would hunch my shoulders at night because yeah. I would think that would protect me from getting bitten. Oh, that is so funny. Yes, like this. Like that. And then I'd wake up and I didn't have any vampire bites. So I'd be like, well, it must have worked. It uh, works. Um, <laughs> was my logic. Um, and so I wrote this, uh, this prose poem in book three. I wrote this um, on the uh, anniversary, the 15th anniversary of 9-11. Okay. And it's untitled. Uh, 
his fingers wrapped in a decadent grip around the looped handle of his wolf's head cane, his black onyx ring on right pointer finger. Barnabas Collins slaps my childhood bedroom window with an autocratic snap of the wrist, shattering the glass, at which point my memory of this recurring dream wavers, a glitch effect. The dream space fractured in sheared horizontal pieces like images from a broken analog television as I toggle between my 1968 vampire nightmares and episode 615 tonight, the 15th anniversary of 9-11. The camera zooms on Barnabas's hand, his fingers gripping Joe Haskell's glass medicine vial. The close-up resurrecting my childhood fear that I'd wake up in the middle of the night without my shoulders hunched. And the last thing I'd ever see would be his right hand, elliptical onyx surrounded by gold band as it brushed away my collar to expose my bare neck and jugular. A fear that triggers a body memory of the excruciating bottom right molar throb that kept me awake the Friday before the attacks. Mm. That by the following weekend, one day after the airports opened again, required an emergency root canal. The mm. endodontist couldn't numb me and she had no choice but to drop the anesthetic directly on my inflamed nerve. <laughs> Shocking pain. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Even saying it is shocking. <laughs> shocking <laughs> pain that lasts just long enough for me to remember that I was terrified. Her office was in a high rise. Oh, Two wow. weeks later, I stopped oh. meditating. Didn't for more than a year because of phantom tooth pain. And every time I sat on my cushion, I put myself into those planes. Oh, wow. Wow, you didn't just take in just the, it's just not the haunting of Barnabas, but wow, to be able to, to, to take in just the, the, you know, you place us back to, you know, your fear of here you were in the dentist's office, 9-11 had happened, and there's so many other fears that are, that are just flooding your brain. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry that you had to deal with the shock of... Well, thank you. And, and that, that is part of what's fun about the book is like weaving all those strands yes. together. Yeah. And, that's why it's, it takes so long to write too because oh absolutely yeah. absolutely yeah. absolutely well i of course you know and i'm sure uh many also caught this but i love the black black onyx ring oh love that thanks absolutely yeah. love that. Th that was such a detail from the from the child yeah oh my god yeah, yeah. and uh the autocratic snap oh, yeah love that and thanks. the broken analog those those just really stuck out to me that just like you could just visualize, I could see just every little, every little snippet. So that oh, that's awesome. wonderful. I'm, that. I'm so glad. And you know, the funny thing is I, the last time, so that was the last time I had horrible, horrible root canal tooth pain yeah. until uh, two weeks ago in the middle of the pandemic, I had another horrible root canal. I felt like my whole head was going to explode. It got infected. Oh, no. And I was like, wow, every time there's like a national tragedy, I get a root canal. So like, I hope my teeth are okay and then the country is yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no kidding. <laughs> well, next yeah. time your teeth start hurting, you need to warn all of us. So I know because it's are aware something's coming. <laughs> exactly. I owe it to everybody to do that. I gotta see the dentist more quickly. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Let me save the world. I'm gonna go to the dentist on a regular Gotta basis. save the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. All right, so um, Andy was saying that there's a new format. There is a little question box that came up here. So a question came up. Oh, Andy was just saying that um, because he believes your writing is so phenomenal and how you wove everything together. He says, I'm throwing my laptop out the window. I'm stopping writing. He's on quitting. <laughs> oh, well, th <laughs> thanks, Andy. But get, take your laptop back. Yeah, don't stop writing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what would be cool? Write a poem about how you want to throw your laptop out the window and then you'll That's have a true. Poem. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> but thanks, Andy. I appreciate it. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So, um, 
You know, I think, did you say that Blake was your favorite poet? I came in like a few seconds late on the very first section of the, the first live, so I wasn't. He's one of my, yeah, I've got a, a dear spot in my heart for William Blake. He's one of my favorites, <laughs> for sure. I go back to him a lot yeah. to make me, feel, to remember like why I love poems. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and you were going back through and you were, um, when you were reading um, Elise's uh, piece, and I believe that was the one she did in comparison with um, Emily Dickinson, because she, she, oh, yes. she references her a lot. And, yeah, she's a big um, Dickinson fan. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I, I love that and how you started to just talk about, you know, that, that even still with, um, you know, the change of the times that we saw so much. I mean, women had the right to vote and everything at that time, but there were still just such limitations, you know, um, on women and that she and that she could just feel that. And I remember one for me was always, I, I love Anais Nen. I, pro I know I don't probably say her name correctly. I never do, but I, I love her works. And I think that she was really, um, just really brazen, you know, when she came out and all of her writings and stuff, I think it just threw everyone, you know, to the wall when she, when she started writing about <laughs> all the yeah. different things that she wanted to write about. And, oh yeah. Yeah. And I, and I love that, you know, and for me, um, I, I just feel like I can relate to a lot of that. Um, I kept my writing very, very quiet. Um, I grew up in a very religious family and so when I started my page, I kept it on the down low because, you know, I, I utilize a lot of my pictures and things as well. My photography, um, which is a lot of self photography along with my poems. And um, so even though I have support of my family, a lot of my family don't read my things because <laughs> it bothers mm -hmm. them. But at least yeah. I have their support. Um, but yeah, I can, um, you know, I grew up with the whole, if there was anything that let's say, um, especially nowadays, we see a lot of cases with, uh, with women who, you know, with um, like date rape scenarios or any type of, you know, altercation or, or abuse. And I remember growing up and hearing a lot in my household of, well, she shouldn't address that way. She was asking for it or, you know, th things along yep. those lines. And so it was a huge fear of mine to, to break free and say, oh, here's my writing family. <laughs> Uh -huh. <laughs> Look what I'm writing about. And, um, you know, and so I was just have been so excited about being able to do the do this live and everything with you and just being able to bring Elise's works, you know, more to light and stuff. So it's been this has just been absolutely phenomenal for me. So it's been awesome. Oh, this anyway. is great. <laughs> no, and yeah. I, I know what you mean that the family stuff, I mean, is uh, the great thing about the thing that made me um, of the many things I loved about editing Elise's book was that when I um, when I had to get the rights from her family because they yeah. owned the work, um, it was her. Uh, um, I'm trying to think of what his exact. I think he's like her great nephew, um, mm -hmm. uh, or maybe her, her second cousin uh, who mm -hmm. runs the estate now. And through him and through other mem I met other members of the family that really supported yeah. her. That you don't really oh, hear about amazing. them in the histories. And yeah. So I, I'm really right. glad there's there's a part of her family that just always knew she was. A great artist and wanted yeah. to work out there so yeah. i was glad i was glad to see that part of her family because they're there and they they they, they believe in in what yeah. she she wrote and and wish she would have been alive to see the poems in print yeah 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 well, and how how amazing it is that you didn't have too much uh you know uh too much of them trying to block your way in doing so that they allowed you to be able to do that i'm really because... grateful that they didn't block yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely phenomenal. Her story is absolutely incredible. I I really really love it. I'm now I'm gonna share. I'm gonna share somebody. All right, let's see who am I gonna share? Who am I gonna share? I'm going to share um, Molly. And so this is Molly. The musings of Molly Maven is her handle, and um, this is called Bottles. And I have to say that everyone who participated in these prompts, they really, really did push themselves, you know, over, you know, above and beyond. And it was so fun for me to be able to read everyone's pieces. I was just like, you could tell, I was just like, they really, they dug deep. They went and expanded beyond what they normally do. And um, so all of these pieces that we get to share tonight, I have to say hats off to all of you guys. You guys are awesome. You're amazing. It's incredible. And I am honored to read your words. So this is Molly and it is called Bottles. Bottles, how they hold what we need inside, staring at that liquid courage, those numbing doses, my thoughts and their long goodbyes, glass, plastic, skin, break them, shake them, give my soul the whole of what begs within and I'll always remember the farewells of December. 
rooms of black cloth crowding the remains of faded embers. I've walked these cold roads before. All the pebbles thrown at stones and bones under my feet they lay in soiled doors, adorning bullet wounds. Necktie, tombs, those breathless bound bodies, I will join them soon, missing sons of June, to wear the dirt that dances on mahogany. Oh, death, how you have kissed my lips. We fell in love, a tryst that grips. I have shed many tears, given many years, but my better moments will just scratch at walls. Tongues split, mouths will spit. Only one second of my life to be recalled, and as I swallow my no tomorrow, the world turns despite such sorrow. So let them say all I was became this day, but I will count the petals plucked, the night so tight, warm, and tucked, the red blanket that burned him into me. The embrace that laced his charming charms to my heart's race, how we cried at the finish line, miles of smiles that were never mine. They belong to a girl I once knew. But these dusty mirrors won't get much clearer. I'm now made of glass, and it shatters blue. A bottle emptied, a covering coffin, or dust confetti. I am nothing more and everything. With the smell of smoke on my last breath, I choke to sing the letters of words which welcome death, a parting note that spoke. Of all the reasons why I fasted hope, a taste these jaws would gladly soak, yet they hang bare, unable to greet the stale air. Please know that I am home. As the sky pulls me to fly, I've woven my wings a refined magpie, no longer bottled by the tegument that ties some rest for the restless. This is why the dreamless die. Mm. That was Molly. Uh, that was great. Thanks, Ooh. Molly. Yeah. Yeah. And she wanted, oh, um, you know, it's just about those questions of like, what would people think or say? Like, what would your story be after you passed? And, yeah. uh, you know, it's just, uh, uh, I love that in relation to here we are talking about Elise so many, so many years later, and yet she still lives on. She lives on in her words, and now she's continuing to almost have a rebirth, it seems, you know, just a, like a, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which I think is beautiful. I think it's incredible, so. <laughs> oh, it's amazing. It's like, it feels like she, the more readers she gets, the more they're adding to the story who she is, and like you're saying about, yes. about uh, the last poem, sense of Molly's poem, like, okay, what, what's the story after I'm gone? And that story gets rewritten yeah. by the readers. And yeah. uh, it's just, yeah. it's fantastic seeing like yeah. so many readers being drawn to her work. It's what it happened yes. 50 years ago, but it's great. It's happening now. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I mean, what is it the same with, uh, with, with Van Gogh and, uh, <laughs> and yeah. all those things that you rec recognize just, uh, just far too late. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. We, recognize yeah. Still. <laughs> but still recognized. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So I almost feel like today, you know, with the beatnik generation being so um, being so vocal and being so bold, um, you know, here we are and what we're faced with, you know, I mean, especially these past few months with, um, you know, with the COVID and now, you know, with everything that's going on with George Floyd. And um, and here we are. And it's time again for for definitely for us to utilize the power that we have and to utilize it in, in the correct format. And we, we can use it, you know, do that by using our words and being powerful and being strong and coming together and raising awareness in such a positive and supportive light and so I almost feel like you know this is us coming together so it's very very um, I think it's just very very powerful that we're all here you know doing this today I think it's really huge I agree I mean it's like when I think of um, what got us to the horrible place we're in now I mean mm -hmm. uh, uh, is obviously like bigotry but also just a failure of the imagination it's just like the leadership just like not having any kind of like creative effort to build a, a, a just world. It takes imagination. And so yeah. when you bring artists, writers, poets together, this is where you've got like this, uh, you know, this boiling pot of imaginative yes. energy. And we need more of that to build a better world, I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, I would love to hear another one of yours. Okay, so I could, maybe I'll read, 
I'll read one more Dark Shadows piece, and then maybe yeah. later just I'll read one that's not a Dark Shadows. Um, yeah, that would be great. Poem. So I'm going to read. So I was trying to think of something that was from not from the new book, one of the earlier books, and um, I thought of this little excerpt. It's from book one, um, uh, and that one's that one's just called "The Complete Dark Shadows of My Childhood." Um, and um, uh, no so worries, is, no worries. Yeah, so there's a little, little David, and he's got psychic powers. So a child, and um, he's been okay. hiding from the vampire in a mausoleum. And then um, that character I mentioned in the last poem, Joe, he comes back and his, uh, the actor's name is Joel Crothers and he, he plays a role in it too. Okay. Uh, okay, so here we go. So little David's running out of the mausoleum. Little David escapes, then runs straight into the arms of Barnabas, proving no child is safe in Collinsport and no doubt spawning nightmares for little boys watching this episode. David, you're acting as though you're afraid of me, Barnabas says, sticking out his wolf's head cane to block the psychic child from running away. The same cane that broke my bedroom window in nightmares. Then later, right before the credits roll, Barnabas's parting words, a hypnotic message sent psychically across the Collinwood estate. David, pleasant dreams, Barnabas says in a cruel, sarcastic voiceover. After following little David's mausoleum plight so closely for six episodes, I couldn't resist looking him up on Wikipedia to see what became of actor David Hennessy, fearing yet another sad tale of a child star who grows up to be a shoplifter or an addict. Though, can he really be called a star when he forgets his lines so much? Then I got distracted and looked up Joe instead, the too articulate paragon of bourgeois Collinsport who looks like the high school football star and student council president who volunteers for Vietnam after graduation. And I discovered actor Joe Others died of AIDS in 1985, two years before the drug AZT. And he was only 44, not much younger than another Joe. We called him Jojo, my favorite uncle, who contracted HIV in Los Angeles and moved back to Erie, Pennsylvania to die in 1991, surrounded mostly by mean-spirited Italians who could not bring themselves to utter the word gay. Mm. I say mostly because I remember my mother spent every day with him in the hospital at the end, though she told anyone outside the family tribe it was cancer. And she took mm. care of Jojo, her little brother, born deaf and mute, like she did when she was a teenager and the rest of the family and that awful immigrant paranoia of the time, World War II and half the neighborhood supported Mussolini until the US declared war on Italy, treated the little boy's inability to hear or speak as an embarrassing aberration, a shame to the clan. My mother, who once asked me to write a poem about the night Jojo broke from a deep coma and sat up straight and stared at the hospital ceiling like he'd tear it up, burn the fucker down. It was always silent with Jojo in a family that never learned to sign. But he raised his arms and he spoke. First time anyone ever heard words come out of his mouth. When, he asked, over and over, then smiled and lay back down to die. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that, that is powerful. That is absolutely incredible. How, I, I'm still just blown away at the fact that you went in to research 
one actor and the connection between that, you know, here you are, you're writing the story, you're, you're writing, you know, your, your memoirs basically in, in relation to this. And you learn about this actor who passed away from AIDS. And then the fact that with your, with your own uncle, I mean, that is just, that's just, wow. That's mind blowing. Uh, thanks. And it's really, I appreciate, I, I appreciate your response because it's very intense to read. Like I, I was, yeah. I decided, you know, a couple of days ago, oh yeah, I'm going to read this. And then in the middle of reading it, I'm like, oh shit, I'm reading this. This is so intense. Yeah. Um, yeah. I tried to write about that night with Jojo. I tried to write about it for like 10 years. Mm -hmm. I kept getting nowhere. I just couldn't get it right. And yeah. then it was, it was the con the context of the dark shadows project. It just yeah. happened. So I'm grateful wow. for that too. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And to be able to give such tribute, you know, in your story, I it's just, it all came together. I mean, how, how you couldn't have asked for it to come together like so much, I mean, any better than that. I mean, it's oh, just- Oh, thank you, thank you. It um, felt right as it was happening. I was like, I wanna yes. roll with this and yeah, yeah. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. All right, looks like there are, are there a couple more questions. Oh, and Mel was saying that Blake is her absolute favorite as well. And, all right. Uh, and Andy was saying that Elise would be proud, so. Oh, that's, <laughs> thank you, that's <laughs> oh my goodness well a lot of us here you know we are we are not you know we're not published you know published poets or, or anything and so um of course you know a, a lot of us tend to like lean towards more of um you know self-publication because you know the poetry world the writing world in general it's just so oversaturated saturated i mean it's just it's just in there and it's hard to get recognized obviously we know i mean to be published is an incredible feat and so um for all of so, for so many you have 12 12 books published 12 mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i mean you know, I mean, that's Thank just amazing, you, you know, it's Thank incredible. You. <laughs> it's incredible. Now, when you look at, um, now, how do you feel about self-publication? What are your um, on? You know, I think, um, I think, it, you know, it, it depends on what you want with your, mm -hmm. um, depends on what you want with your poems. Like if you, mm -hmm. I, I know folks who will self-publish because they, they want to perform their work at readings and they want something to give to people, sell to people at readings. And mm -hmm. it doesn't matter to them whether an editor published it. Mm -hmm. Longer term career though, I like I try to tell my students not to self-publish, not because there's anything mm -hmm. wrong with self-publishing, but just because if your work has gone through an outside editor who doesn't know you and they've published mm -hmm. your work, it's going to have a little more authority in the poetry world. And I always want my students to have that authority. I want people yeah. to listen to them. You yeah, know? Um, absolutely. So it really depends on what you want. Like if you, if you want to law, you know, think of the career in terms of print and performance and like, um, you know, how people are going to look at it long-term, I would say mm -hmm. try to not self publish, even though it takes longer to get your work published that way without a doubt. Right. And right. Editors, a lot of editors are really nice, but a lot of them are really cranky, you know, but, um, yeah, yeah. but if you're thinking like my friends who, you know, it's like me as a musician, um, with drumming on glass, we had a record company, we had a record deal, we had a contract, all that, but the bands I've been in since then, Bummer Deluxe, my current band, Pet Theories, my older band, you know, we, we self, um, self-financed our CDs because we mm -hmm. want to perform and we want people yeah. to buy it or give away the work. We just want people to hear right. it. And. And so we're self-publishing right. our music and that's yes. fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it really is just like what, like you said, like what you're looking for, like how, what you, how want, you want your yeah. voice to be heard. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, how you want, well, what kind awesome. of audience you want, how you want to speak to them and so on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, so let's see, I have, because I, I have a few more to read. And so I, sorry, I always do like a sing song, like response. That's just, everyone's used to it by now, but <laughs> I apologize for. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All righty. I'm actually going to read, I'm going to read Jared's. And so this is Jared Presser. And so this is uh, forget it underscore 42. And he actually just posted this one today. And, uh, you know, again, very, very relevant with what's happening in the world today. So um, pretty, pretty powerful. And this is called Believe. Struggling to gain my footing when I live in a world 
that's bleeding. Can't put faith in a loving God who committed the first act of racism. I try to find that space in life where peace can be found, even in a handout society. There's no peace around. I can't reflect back as a kid when things seem simpler because hate has been happening since Lucifer betrayed his father. We all have our struggles. Life was never meant to be easy. We're all just chasing cheese in the maze of society. When the media gives us stories to fuel our anger, we need a worldwide Woodstock to bring us all back together. We shouldn't see color, we shouldn't see poor, we should never turn our backs and care a whole, whole lot more. Just strive to be different and stand for what's right. Judgment should never be passed based on black or white. He had a dream and I have a dream too, but the world gives us dreams with a nightmare view. Black, white, or brown, it's all the same. Don't let the media destroy us by segregating our names. The hurt in people is not based on color. It's based on the hate that's been passed down from generations of fathers. We have the power of generations within our voices, but we allow ourselves to be muted by controversial media stories. For generations now, this hate has been real, but let's become the generation that starts to heal. It will never be erased, but always exist. That's what we're told. Let's just give our children a chance to know the difference. Let's give them more. Show stories of love and us picking up our brothers. Let's find the solution by blending all colors. There's no equality when hate is the leader. There's no hope in a future when evil controls all the power. Don't put faith and hope in what they tell you to believe. Put love and trust in the change that we need. God is there, God may care, but if God is teaching us a lesson, then that God is not fair. What kind of father would mark his son so people would know exactly what he's done? Don't pass judgment is a commandment. We're taught that God gives power to the wicked and unjust. I'm struggling to find my footing within my worldly eyes. That's why I close them and dream that change is alive. That my faith is wavering in anything that saves. There's no one who can change this but people who are brave. Who can fight hate with love and not retaliation as the powerful sit back and encourage us to destroy each other? It's what they want and they know all along if they feed us with fire, we'll continue to burn. Must rock the boat and change the system. Replace hate with love and leave an impression. Don't close our eyes to the hate and injustice. Let's just change the script and show them we got this. You want us to riot and hate our brothers? Well, I'll stand to defiance next to each other, every heart because our hearts beat the same color. Let justice be served upon those who feel hate. Just don't let justice be served by those of deceit. God and media, government of states, those who strike fear because their blood pumps hate. Stop with the hate and give us a chance. Let love replace all these hurtful circumstances. Mm. Oh, that was Jared. great. That, that was Jared? Yeah, that's uh, Jared. That's uh, forget it underscore 42. And he just oh, that posted was... that today. Um, so he's, he's amazing. Absolutely incredible writer. I mean, that I think is just so, I mean, he hit every single point. <laughs> in no, that that one. was great. Thanks, Jared. Yeah. There yeah. was that line that really got me. I had to write it down. Uh, the yeah. world gives us dreams with a nightmare of you. And I felt like the whole poem was just sort of like, like, uh, that was like the magnet attracting everything in the poem. It was really yes. great. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was an, it was absolutely incredible. He did he did a phenomenal phenomenal job job with that. And totally absolutely. relevant to where we are right now. Yeah, <laughs> totally relevant. I know yeah. I was uh, talking with my daughter today, and we were just talking about the sadness of of the riots because we've had peaceful protests here, mm -hmm. and um, they've been very very peaceful. And um, you know, and there is so much power within words. And it's it we were just talking about how sad it is because it diminishes the power of words when all we're seeing all of our media is the act of violence. And there's so much, there is so much beauty actually going on right now um, in, you know, in support of, you know, George Floyd and his family and in support of, you know, the African American community. And unfortunately, our, our media is just being so focused on the negativity. And, um, you know, there are some very powerful movements happening out there. Yeah, I'd say that the, I def, definitely like the most the most powerful images I've seen of people coming together in the protests mm -hmm. have been mm -hmm. images I've had to see on Twitter and on Instagram. I haven't mm -hmm. been seeing in them in mainstream. You know, they, they don't sell exactly. advertising like right. images of bricks through windows. You know, yeah. yeah.
exactly. It's 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 very it feels very similar to you know when we have to unfortunately have to experience the tragedy tragedies of like the school shootings when the focus all of a sudden becomes on the shooter rather than the amount of lives and how it affects those um, you know yeah that have had to endure it. Um, you know we just you know we need to spread positivity. We need to spread yeah. Positive voices that it is doing something. <laughs> I mean, we're here. Are trying They're... to come together. Yeah. Exactly, and change does. Unfortunately, change does take a while. It, yeah. We have to be patient. We have to be patient, and um, you know, as a society, as a nation, we have really. There are a lot of things we have done as a nation that we should be <laughs> proud of. You know, that we have come together to be able to do. And it's just unfortunate that you know the negativity is just weighing down so much right now. But yeah, the negativity sells. Sadly, yeah, I know, I know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, how is um? So now, are you guys all like on on, on law, online program now for your you know for your uh, for your college for your school? Well, we're online um, starting when Chicago went into quarantine around March, mm -hmm. mid March. We went online. Yeah. And um, right now, the plan is to be in person in the fall. Oh. And okay, if that happens. I'd rather be in person because I, I just I like yeah. to, you know see people you know in in, in yeah. person, but you know we're we're being asked to just you know keep have a plan B in case we have to go online and who knows I yeah. mean if we get a giant surge of the virus in a month or so we might have to be online so we all kind of have to wait and yeah. see. Right. Yeah. I believe that for here, um, Chico State and um, our JC that they're going to go on ahead and just stick with the online program just for the fall. And just so the fall, they're like, yeah. we're just going to go ahead. Yeah. And they're like, we're just going to continue on with it. So, um, you know, I mean, shoot, all we did was we were doing really, really well. And then Memorial Day weekend came and we opened up our, um, our county and we ended up getting, we ended up doubling our cases like in three days. <laughs> so that was a bummer. <laughs> yeah. Chicago officially opens up in two days and oh. I don't know. Oh. We'll see. I have a feeling we're going to get a lot of cases. I hope we don't, but I have a feeling we are. I know. Yeah. I know. I hope I Hopefully, hopefully it just starts curving, going away. <laughs> I know. I All know. right. Um, you want to read something else? Sure. In fact, since we're talking about um, the quarantine and the pandemic, um, yeah, I have a. This is probably my newest poem, and um, it's uh, it's a standalone, non dark shadows poem, um, and it's really, yeah, it's about uh, really the the day that. Um, the day that the governor of Illinois said uh, we're going into quarantine. And it's awesome. called, At Three O'Clock, The Governor Speaks. Mm. We're all about to learn the difference between solitude and loneliness. When you're not alone by choice, time passes in one slow, interminable slab, anxiously ongoing. My bandmate, Luke, texts, to warn me the governor is speaking at three o'clock to announce a statewide lockdown order. He adds a video his friend shot on her phone, a railway flat car carrying a fleet of desert camouflaged military Humvees into Chicago. Mm. What needs to fall apart before they roll down Sheridan Road? Mm. It's 1.30 and I'm not sure how much of the city is going dark or how long this will last. Time enough to walk to the liquor store before we're ordered to quarantine. Just a person on the sidewalk, a man coming out of CVS with toilet paper. Time enough for a pandemic detour. They've been sold out the past two weeks. I buy a package of 12, two rolls of paper towels, a bottle of dish detergent. The shelves for Clorox spray and Lysol wipes are empty, as I expected. I had to check anyway. Mm -hmm. I'm wearing winter gloves all wash when I return home. I possibly carry all this plus alcohol. So I skip <laughs> the liquor store. Embarrassed, <laughs> walking home, a toilet paper 12 plaque under my arm, way too big for my bag. Please are built for congregation. Chicago is shutting down. My friends used to correct me when I said plague instead of pandemic. Now we all say self-isolation as well any of it. Rikers Island, 
its infection rate eight times higher than New York, the country's plague epicenter, is offering convicts $6 per hour to dig mass graves. Average mm. US prison wage, barely a dollar an hour. The day 1,300 Americans tested positive, the president who called it a hoax said, just stay calm, it will go away. 6,000 new cases today alone, a week and a half later. Supermarket panic buying is already a habit. How quickly we adapt. The first time I saw bare grocery shelves, I was 20, working a sleep deprived third shift at Giant Eagle. The shrill fluorescent Muzak, a theater of abundance every morning by 9 a.m. when my shift was over and I'd stop the store again and packages of food. My parents, first generation immigrants, prepared me for an off script, improvised deus ex machina that could arise anytime and make it all vanish. My father didn't see a flush toilet until he was drafted into World War II. I didn't believe him. <laughs> we'll know more at three o'clock. <laughs> Every time I hear someone say lockdown, I wince. Our streets already are nearly vacant. The pavement scorched without people walking on it. We're learning it's possible to run out of anything. Hmm. Wow. I love how you even started off with um, like the solitude versus the loneliness. That, that to me is really, really fascinating because, you know, here we are and we have to, you know, like even how you reference self-isolation, but it's really, it's really not a choice. This really isn't an option. This is what we have to do, you know, during this time. And so, boy, yeah, solitude and lonely, loneliness, completely different things, completely yeah. different things. <laughs> yeah, they're like, they're crash landing on all of us these days. I know, <laughs> more than ever. Yeah. Yeah. They are, they are like huge. I mean, man, I mean, we, we dealt with loneliness prior and we felt alone before. And now to add in, you know, the solitude and the isolation, it's just, it's just a ticking time bomb. I mean, if anything, I think so. the riots and everything that we're expecting, it's just, it's just, it, I feel like it's almost even more fueled and more on fire because of what we've been coming out of, you know, um, that everyone is just so so on the edge where we all seem to be so nervous we all seem to be filled with fear left and right and unknown we don't really have any answers i mean right it's pretty pretty scary and it's and the the whole the <laughs> virus is like this invisible invader and we've got that and then we've got uh, uh racism and, yeah. and, and economic oppression it's just like man <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's we'll get through it but the world the world is yeah the world is burning <laughs> <laughs> the world is burning. The world is on yeah. fire. <laughs> yeah. I have a piece here by Twinks. And um, so this is Twinks Fly. And it is called um, Trash. And I love how she, how her setup is of, you know, of, of how she, he, she did her formatting on her piece. And so this is Twinks. It's the first week of June. Sun is raining flowers today, purple, blue, violet, aquamarine, and all of them burn as she wriggles back home in shame. Scalding her skin off, charring her flesh to bare bones, bones that are tired of carrying the weight of her frail body. Questioning, is she anything more but a plastic toy meant for pleasure? Succumbing to her rightful place with the dust choking on the ground, with the maggots choking on the ground, cursing her breasts, choking on the ground. It's the first week of June and all the blossoming flowers adorned in the bouquet of acceptable consume her in a gulp alive. And all her burnt pieces are left in a trash can on the sidewalk with the burnt cigarettes they smoked for another high. Mm. These twinks fly. Oh, twinks, that was great. Yeah, wow. Wow. Yeah. Uh, that, uh, that, like, that, it's kind of like what we were just talking about. It's like, it's June, everything's mm -hmm. blossoming, but yeah, uh, everything's under assault. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. And I, I, I think it's just, it's just hard for us to even 
you know, it's just hard to accept and even swallow. It's like, is this really, really happening? You know, I mean, I, I'm so, I'm a little bit far more removed from it than so many. Um, you know, I, it, like, I'm sure you are witnessing, like, it's, it's there. You're, you're seeing a lot of, you know, the riots and different things. And for me, you being up in Northern California, smaller town, you know, and we're a little bit more subdued. I mean, even with the COVID, you know, I mean, mm, uh, no, this is true, a whole, right. the, yeah, the way that I'm seeing it is so different than your guys' viewpoints. And so it's been very, it's been very interesting to sit back and see it all play out on screen for me, per se. Oh, yeah, you know? yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, so. I can imagine. But, and then I have family down in L.A., and we were just talking with them last night, and, you know, and I mean, they're terrified, you know, they're oh, terrified. I, I mean, my cousin, he's just like, this is happening two blocks, you know, from my home, <laughs> you know, and it's just um, unfortunate that something that was supposed to start out as peaceful and positive and impactful is, you know, it's taken the turn that it has, so. But yeah. it is just an interesting time but yeah I've, I've yeah. been I've been definitely set back from it so it's been different for me yeah yeah I, I've I have to remember sometimes that if you're not living in a densely packed area you're going to experience the pandemic differently because like mm -hmm. in Chicago it's just you know we're, we're all packed together and, and God you yeah. gotta go out but you gotta be really yeah. careful uh when I go for my walk, I'll have a mask on and, and uh, yeah. hope, I hope everyone else will. <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, You're like, pretty... I'm protecting me. You protect yourself too. We protect each other. Yeah, can we all just do that? <laughs> I know. And it's, but it's like, it's serious stuff because we're, 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 uh, we're yeah. in such con so close contact with each other in a city. So yeah. 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 Well, it looks like yeah. it's going to be ticking down. I have two minutes left. I know I have Mel's piece and, um, I'm not going to worry about my piece right now because we're going to be ending, but I do want to read Mel's piece because she submitted for it. And so I'm going to read hers. So this is the, um, the dot saint dot atlas. And this is Mel. There are flowers blooming, dead, lacking, like blood. Before, air is tasted. Cries feed the roots. Souls nourishing the heart of palms covered in dirt, fingers broken from digging, 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 burying hope before he was ever given a chance to. Mm, wow. Mel. Wow, Mel, that was intense. Thanks. Wow. Yeah. Another perfect <laughs> yeah. where we are right now, right? Wow. wow. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, it was, uh, it was absolutely incredible. And yeah, it's ticking down. I got 50, 50 seconds left, but, oh. um, yeah, I know. I know. It's like our time, our time went over. So it really went fast. Over. Wow. Yeah. I know yeah. it went like so fast, it went yeah. so fast, but, um, but yeah, so I am going to, I'm going to DM you my piece just because I want to share it with Please you. Please do. So. I was going to say that. I'd love to see it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 I will definitely, I'll definitely cool. uh, send it your way. Thank you guys, everyone, for joining us and for letting us read your beautiful, glorious pieces. And um, thank you, Tony, for just being here and sharing and giving us awareness to Elise and the Beatnik generation and for us being a little bit more familiar with you. So it's been oh. absolutely a pleasure. It was a lot yeah. of fun. Thanks for having me. This was great. It was so great. Yeah. It was awesome. All right. Thank All right. you. Have a All good right, night. Everyone. You All too. Right. You bye too. Bye.